Happy Sabbath, everybody. Sabbath. Thank you for that special music. The piano sounds wonderful. Just getting this started. As we look at today's message, I want to give you an up. Before we look at today's message, I want to give you an update on Glenn, the atheist we've been praying for. Now, Friday was the last day of his 30 day challenge. Some of you know that a week prior, he ended up getting hip replacement surgery. And since then, he has gone missing in action. I haven't heard from him. He hasn't replied back. I have sent them tweets, and I know that he has read them, but he hasn't replied. So continue to pray for him. Maybe he's under conviction, or maybe he's just tired of me. Either way, as long as we know uh, what, that he is well, let's continue to pray with him. Today, in our sermon, we are going to look at the circumstances of the birth of Christ. I want to look at it from just three perspectives, from the perspective of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus slash God. And the first glimpse I want to look at is found in the book of Luke. So I ask you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Luke, chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. Luke, chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. Luke, chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin, a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, for the Lord is with you. Now if an angel came to you and said these words, me, the way I think, I would think, wait a minute, the Lord is with me, wasn't he already with me? Like, what's going on? So I would begin to question what's going on, and we see that Mary does that too. But then there is that other notion, greetings, favored one. Now, when I read that, the first thing that came to my mind was Noah. Remember that God, Noah found favor in the eyes of God. So there would be a mixed feelings. Is the Lord with me? Wasn't he not with me prior? But why am I favored? What's going on? What is happening in my life? And as a matter of fact, Mary didn't understand immediately what was taking place. Verse 29, she says, but she, but she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, now here comes the pronouncement of what favor she has found. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Amen? Amen. But Mary said, concerned about biological function, how can this be since I am a virgin? Now she was right to question this because despite what people say or some uneducated atheists may say, they knew how kids came back in that day. They knew biological function. So she is asking a very legitimate question. How can this be when I haven't been with a man? The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son in her old age, which we tend to know it's harder. And she who was called barren is now in the sixth month. And I love this next verse. For nothing will be impossible with God. Amen. How much? Amen. Nothing. So the atheists get it wrong when they say nothing created everything. Because nothing is impossible with who? Not by chance, but with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. 
I want to share a personal aspect of my wife and myself when it comes to verse 38. Many of you know that my wife and I, we had trouble for close to four years conceiving. Long story short, as you know, it wasn't until we went gluten-free and 10 months later we conceived, but there was a powerful prayer by John, a friend of mine named John, who prayed for us and then we conceived. But this verse has a special meaning because before we were able <coughs> to release our desire to have children, my mother-in-law sent a nice picture frame with these words to my wife. Behold, the bond slave of the Lord may be done to me according to your word. And if we're honest, my wife really didn't like that my mother-in-law sent this verse. <laughs> We weren't prepared to be without children. We weren't prepared to relinquish that desire to the Lord. But as fate would have it, it wasn't until my wife let go of the desire to have children that we conceived Hannah, and now we have Leah and them. It is not until we leave every desire that we have to do it our way that God will act in our favor. May it be done to me according to your word should be the prayer and desire of whatever we want that we should leave it to the Lord. And so we see in the life of Mary these emotions. She was perplexed and pondering. She was she had fear but was given reassurance. She was questioning and seeking understanding. And then finally, she accepted and submitted to the will of God. Overall, Mary's emotional journey in these verses moved from perplexity and fear to questioning and ultimately to acceptance and submission. This progression reflects a deep faith and trust in God's plan. Despite the initial natural human reactions and confusion and apprehension, she surrendered her will to God. Mm -hmm. We see this in our own lives, not just once, but on a repeated basis as we journey on this road we call sanctification. Like a child who is building trust in his parents with every passing day, week, month, and year. This wasn't a one-time experience with Mary, and it's not a one-time experience with us. At each level, we have to grow deeper in our trust and surrender more our will to the will of God. So I ask you, ladies, how would you have felt being visited at that angel and given these very words? Now we turn to Joseph. Turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Matthew, chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Matthew, chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph... Before they came together, she was found to be child with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for God who has been conceived in her, for the child who has been conceived in her, is of the Holy Spirit. Here's the promise. She will bear a son and you shall call him Jesus, for he will save his people from his sins. Now look, now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took Mary as his wife, 
but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. In the verses from Matthew 1 to 18 to 25, we can infer Joseph's emotions based on his actions and the situation he described. There was confusion and a dilemma. Have you ever been there? Confused and in a dilemma with our Lord and Savior? Not knowing what God is up to when you feel like you need Him the most? I don't know about you, but I've been there plenty of times, including as a pastor. There was compassion and concern. Can you feel the compassion and concern for someone who has wronged you? See, at that moment, he thought Mary had betrayed the sacred trust that they had. Can you feel compassion and concern for someone who has wronged? See, it's easy to be a Christian. It's easy to be lovely. It's easy to be kind and courteous to those who are your friends. But can you show compassion and concern for an atheist who had a hip replacement just a couple, just a week ago? Imagine, men, if you were in the shoes of Joseph. Your fiancé is suddenly pregnant by the Holy Spirit. But imagine had Joseph reacted before, before having all the information and put Mary away. How many times have we acted without having all the information, not only from our fellow men and women or children, but from God himself? I think what we learn from Joseph as he was a righteous man is do not make decisions in haste. Let your emotions settle and wait for the Lord. In due time, God will give you his answer. However, some of those answers may not come to willing till we are in glory. There was fear in Joseph, but reassurance as well. In Joseph's darkest moment, in a cloud of suspicion, he lived with Mary. Not his own suspicion, for he had been relieved of that, my God. But everybody around him, for as long as he lived, was, yeah, right. She was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He had to bear that shame. He had to bear those snickering remarks. Not that he was suspicious after the angel told him, but let's admit this miracle is not a common practice in society. It's a one-off event. Even though Jesus Christ resurrected, there have been resurrections before. Even though Jesus Christ was resurrected, we one day, those of us who die in Christ, will resurrect. There will only be one virgin birth. So we take this by faith. And Joseph had to live under that pressure for all his life. And not only that, he never got to see the fruits of this blessed child. For he died before even the ministry of Christ began. Yes, he got a glimpse of it throughout his childhood. Yes, he got a glimpse of it at the temple when Christ was only 12 years old. But he died never having seen the ministry of Jesus begin. Joseph's emotional journey in these verses include confusion and dilemma, compassion and concern for Mary, fear and reassurance from the divine message, and finally obedience and faith in the face of challenging circumstances. These emotions highlight his righteous character and his deep commitment to both Mary and to God's will, even when you don't get all of the answers. We've looked at Mary and Joseph, and now we look at Jesus, or God. What can we say about the baby king? The baby's emotions aren't shared, nor can he share and even if he was able to share, they are recorded in sacred history. Yet we are left without insight. For the birth of Jesus wasn't a last second event, nor an unintended event. See, this virgin birth wasn't something that just sprung up 
in the life of Mary. It wasn't something that just took place with Mary. It had been prophesied, and we are going to look at these verses per se, but you can jot them down. From the very beginning, that Adam and Eve sinned. In Genesis 3.15, it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. The first prophecy hinting at the child to be born, a child that would defeat the serpent that has caused all of our pain. See, Christmas is about the child who was born, who lived, who died, who was buried and resurrected, that you may have the gift of eternal life. Amen. And so Eve, as we're told in the spirit of prophecy, was hoping that one of her male children would be this male who would crush the head of the serpent. Then there is Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, God with us. However, when you look at the original language, this word translated virgin does not mean virgin. It means a woman capable of conceiving. And I can imagine, because they had a local prophecy, that it perhaps we're not given the details, so some of this is my own speculation, but I think of the situation with my wife. Many people, after the years had passed by, one year, two years, three years, had lost hope that we would conceive, had lost hope that we would have our own children. And so to them, it would seem impossible, and it would have to be a miracle of the Lord. And so perhaps the young lady in this situation was in that situation. Perhaps people knew she was age of conceiving, but hadn't yet conceived, and God would say, that this barren woman, or this woman who had yet to conceive, would conceive. In my own life, is it less of a miracle that we discovered she had celiac disease and that's why she conceived? God is not afraid to use natural means to perform a miracle. And having had John Baxter pray over us, and having felt the power of the Holy Spirit, the natural person will say, yes, it was the gluten-free. But I say it was the power of God that led us to that natural discovery that now we have three beautiful daughters. However, in Matthew and in Luke, the word used for virgin is and can only mean virgin. And so that's the marker that this was a special birth, unlike anything else prophesied in the Old Testament. Micah 5, 2. But as for you, Bethlehem, where the baby was born, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you will go forth for me, will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His going forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. So now we're not just talking about a little human baby boy, but this individual who will be born in Bethlehem, his days are from when? <clears throat> Eternity. Jeremiah 23, 5, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. Once again, a, a prophetic announcement that there will be a child born who will rule as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness. In Isaiah 11, 1 and 2, then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. The virgin birth wasn't something that happened by chance. It had been prophesied over hundreds and hundreds of years. They had been waiting for this day. But the people found themselves neglectful when the day arrived. How often have we been warned that the second coming will catch many people by surprise? 
It had been prophesied. It is being preached. We preach about it. We talk about it, about being ready. But many in the world will be like in the days of Noah, like in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, unaware that the second coming is right at the door and ready to come. My favorite verse prophesying the birth of this child is Isaiah 9, 6. For a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. And the government will rest on his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Amen? Amen. A child. Those of us who have kids or been around kids, how helpless is a child? Think about it. We don't remember basically our first five years of our lives, totally dependent on our parents, totally dependent on our caregivers. But a child will be born, and he will be a wonderful counselor, mighty God, eternal Father, and Prince of Peace. And the New Testament tells us in Galatians 4.4, 4, but when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. And what time is this? But the prophecies of Daniel chapter 9, which tells us about the ministry of Jesus as the Savior of the world. And this was unique to Christianity, unique in the Old Testament, because in Daniel chapter 3, the Chaldeans tell Nebuchadnezzar that the gods do not dwell in human flesh. But unlike the gods of Babylon who do not dwell in human flesh, Daniel chapter 3 is a reminder to us that the Jews did not believe this because God has always said, build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among you. And Hebrews tells us that a body you have prepared for me because he wanted to be intimate with you. He wanted to be intimate with me. He sent his son that he may dwell among us, that he may be born among us, that he may walk our path, that each of us may accept that baby child and recognize in him this helpless baby, the God of the universe. He was helpless. <laughs> but God has always wanted to be intimate with us. He asked them to build us a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. But he himself created our first home with Eden. I mean, with Adam and Eve in Eden, our first parents had an intimate relationship with God. Then after sin, he said, build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among you, that a body you have prepared for me. All in all, he is our man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. You think of the garden, it was perfect. We could touch everything except for that one tree. And then the king of kings who had everything is born in a lonely manger to poor parents, the opposite of what Adam and Eve had. They wanted a higher status, he came for a lowly status. They wanted power and desire, he came for humility and service. And so you put yourself in one of these situations. Who are we in the story of Christmas? Are you Mary who receives the good news of the gospel and wants to share with everybody who understands that God has a special mission for you and your mission is to share the gift of Christmas with other people and rejoicing with them in the joy that you have been favored by God. Or are we Joseph at Christmas? Who, yes, is happy for the situation but always has that tinge of wondering what could be. For even in the most faithful human, in the most faithful Christian, we have moments of doubt. <coughs> Are you Joseph who played a big role in the life of Christ? Yes, he raised him. But in, as far as scripture, he's quickly forgotten. We don't know what happened to him after uh, the temple with Jesus. 
We don't know how he died. We don't know where he's buried. Not much is said of him. Are we content to play the role that God has for us during this Christmas season? Perhaps your story, as simple as it be, may be what someone needs to get into a faith-saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe all our stories here at the Woodlands are Joseph. Maybe all our stories do not have a blip in the timeline of salvation's history. But I know for certain that in our lives there are people who will only know the gospel because you have shared it with them. Amen. Are we Joseph? Are we Mary? But whether we are Joseph or Mary, we have Jesus in our life. Amen. He will calm your anxieties. He will calm your fears. He will bring you comfort. And perhaps Christmas is not so much about what we receive or what we give, but it's a reminder to, in the difficult times to hang on to that helpless baby who came that you may have eternal life. Amen. See, you can have all the gifts of this world, but if you don't have the gift of that child, you have nothing. But that baby gave everything for you and for me. He gave the adoration of the angels. He gave his comfortable life next to the Father and the Holy Spirit. But not only did he give all that up to become a helpless babe, he did it knowing that he would be persecuted, that he would be reviled, that he would be spit upon, that he would be slapped, that he would eventually be crucified, but the worst of all, that he would be rejected by the very ones he came to save. And yet he said these words, not my will, but thy will. <coughs> May this Christmas season, because the holidays can always be tough, when we miss loved ones that aren't with us anymore, but hang on to the gift, for Jesus has promised to reu reunite us with those we have lost in the faith. He's the gift that keeps on giving. He's the gift that will never end. He is the gift of eternal life. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you that in the life of Mary we see the spectrum of emotions, that we see that we can have a prominent role like Mary or a secondary role like Joseph. But no matter what, both have Jesus Christ as their Savior. Father, may we never forget whether we play a primary role or a secondary role to share the gift that will give everybody eternal life. We thank you and we love you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.